welcome to another what is video um, I kind of like doing these I think I'm gonna take it past uh, eschatology and ecclesiology stuff and go into some other stuff eventually but for this one I'm gonna look at what is covenant theology and um, I want to say at the front of this that I have a lot to say about covenant theology um, I have a lot more knowledge than uh, what may be shown on this video of covenant theology but this video is not meant to be uh, and and uh, in depth, um, I guess you could say, a treatise that I would submit to uh, a university for um, you know a grade. This is uh, this is not something uh, that's done on a high scholarly level. That that's meant to be um, you know overly technical and flush out every issue in every corner and all that kind of stuff. Um, there are some people that say um, that they rarely see a view articulated and explained or described in a way that the opposing you know people would would explain their view in other words coming from me someone who's close to progressive dispensational view it's rare that someone like me would accurately and adequately present a covenant theology view the same goes for a calvinist and an arminian they tend to misrepresent each other's views to try to you know win um, and also I would say it's rare that people speak straightforward on these things and sometimes when people speak straightforward on something it's confused with misrepresenting so I'm probably going to be somewhere in between those because I really hate covenant theology and I think it's dangerous and satanic and at the same time um, there's good godly people who, be who have believing this system uh, of interpretation of really the whole Bible. That's what all these systems are. Covenant theology, dispensationalism, progressive dispensationalism, and new covenant theology are all streams and types of systems for understanding the totality of the Bible. It's not a small issue, and it's not something extremely easy to peg down. So with that as a kind of introduction, let's look at this. Let's see, this is what covenant theology claims. And I just wrote this PowerPoint. Hopefully it's not full of grammatical or spelling errors. I'm just trying to get this done, get it over with, and move on to other things that I want to. Um, so what does it claim? Well, I have books over on my shelf. I'm not going to get them. Um, the books will typically that try to tell you and articulate the view um, or people that talk about it, you're almost 100% of the time going to hear them start with, the covenant of the works. Adam is given, you know, simple command in the garden by God. Um, do this, don't do this, and he fails. And from then on out, the entirety of the human race, all of humanity, has been fallen sinners in need of grace. And that's it. Um, that's essentially what they will go through. And um, to varying degrees of complexity, they are really just trying to weave the web that will explain to you that there is you know a heavy emphasis on there's not two peoples of God it's always been truly redeemed people and um, it's always been a need for grace um, this would be at its core a direct refutation rightly so of some classic dispensational views like you know, there's a time where man actually worked for his salvation and, and he earned it type thing. Uh, you'll find that in the school, old Schofield reference Bibles or something. That's a very horrific view, and this is true. There was a covenant of works, do this and don't do this. And God, Adam is in a perfect relationship with God based off of his, he's in a perfect state. And if he does that, he, he will live forever in, in, in essence. But he doesn't, and he fails. And ever since then, we've been in need for grace. Wonderful. Um, and, and notice it says from fall until a return of Christ. They don't believe that there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth where there are sinners living and dying and whatnot. Uh, so when Christ returns to these people, um, anybody who believes in CT, covenant theology, um, they were to be preterists or they'll be all millennial or it'll be post millennial. When Christ comes back, that's a wrap. There is no more, um, you know, even a trace of sin or nothing like that. It's over. So. Uh, from then, the covenant of grace, I don't, I guess, you know, they'll have their own terms in describing it from there on out. All right, so what's wrong with that? Well, to be honest with you, not much if you just stop there. And that's why I think uh, it's so dangerous. And that's why I really, uh, one of the more reasons that I hate it, and I don't understand why good godly men uh, do what they do. Because for a student of theology, for a Bible teacher, for, a, you know, just a common person, it's nearly impossible to weed through what they say and understand what they're really saying 
um, they go th they go through a good example I got at the bottom of the page here is the God of Promise by Michael Horton and I wanted to throw the book down like really early on because I'm like what am I reading this for I was not dispensational at the time I, I was all millennial uh, I was you know looking for someone to explain the view and it was this I don't know who he wrote it for I guess he wrote it just solely so someone like R.C. Sproul could read it but it was not to me. It wasn't to just somebody who just wanted a simple understanding to build on. And then you go deeper later on. It was, you know, convoluted. And it was talking about stuff that didn't make sense. It was like, okay, I, I agree. You know, covenant works, covenant great. Oh, I, I, where are you going with this type thing? And then later on in the book, you, you start getting like, all right, there are fours type thing. All right, now this, this baptism now is a sign and a seal. A sign and a seal of salvation. What does a seal of salvation mean? I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians says, not by baptism. Um, and that's that's when you get these kind of weird uh, means of grace type words and, and stuff from people that believe stuff like this, usually Presbyterians or something, some Reformed Baptists, you know, like the, uh, the uh, Lord's Supper or baptism are means of grace. Like like if you have the Lord's Supper, somehow it gives you gives you grace from having the Lord's Supper. Um which I'd always say, like, what do you mean by that? What it is is it's it's re, you know, re uh, capsuled. Uh, they put it in a little, a new, uh, a new look on it, the new clothes on it. They dress it up and paint it, and it's Roman Catholicism theology painted uh, as something that's biblical. It's it's just a way, and that's why this Zwingli come up with covenant theology, and other people like Calvin, you know, kept kept on working on it and sanitizing the system they're trying to at least and really what it is is the reformers coming out of Rome they're trying to make you know theology for all this weird stuff that Rome was doing and uh, that's where covenant theology comes from so you, it's an attempt to sanitize doctrines like infant baptism and uh, you know like the different views on uh, the Lord's Supper like the real presence of Christ all these weird terminologies used it's just it's weird but what is always padded with is, is like good sounding language like they'll talk forever I've heard a post millennials talk forever saying things like, I agree with that I agree with that but all of a sudden it's like therefore this and it's like what no no how'd you get there and they'll never talk about the passages that fly in their face and that's why I want to talk about it with this because for most people going into the different things is not going to help them going into you know like terminology or all this stuff I, I'm the type of person that wants to know what does it look like and that's what I want to show you here and just talk about briefly because it's generally true recently on Facebook I come in contact with a guy who you know had a problem with what I said about covenant theology or something and I, he said you know uh, the church is Israel or something like that and I'm like alright you want to test that and he's like yeah sure so I said exegete Ezekiel 37 and he never did. He refused to do it. He he called me names, said I was being mean and all this kind of stuff. But he never would exegete Ezekiel 37. Um, it was utter refusal to. He had to he had to make me into a boogeyman, so he had to dodge it. And the question would be, well, why would someone not want to exegete Scripture um, if they think their view is correct? Um, and here's the reason why. Generally, not every single person is going to agree with this. Most of them do. And I have commentaries on my shelf to prove it. It's been documented in other videos I've done. They will say in Ezekiel 37, go read the chapter yourself. It's talking about a future gathering and salvation of Israel. Um, the gathering may have already happened in part. Who knows? Uh, but it says these things. And I got bolded and underlined the things to, to look at. Um, it says he's going to take the children of Israel from among the heathen. So who's Israel in that? And, you know, this anybody who's keeps covenant theology, bring them through this yourself, and you'll see really quickly, like, what are you talking about? You know, like, and this is where, you know, the rubber hits the road type thing. Like, give me, show me what your system looks like, and I'll show you how biblical it is. And uh, so, yeah, so here we go. It's like, okay, who knows what they'd say at this point. Maybe it's ethnic Israel. Maybe it's, you know, just all the church. And gathering the church from the heathen. And they're going to bring them in their own land. Well, what's their own land? Well, heaven. Uh, you know, this is based off a New Testament passage or something. It's heavens, their own land. And uh, make them one nation. We're one people. Make them one people, God. We're one nation. And uh, no more two nations. No idea what you do with that. Probably ignore it. Um, you know, look at, look at in this context. I'm just going to give you the CT 
general, you know, what they might say more blunt than they ever would without the padding and making it sound uh, acceptable to you. I'm just telling you generally what they would say from this, um, at least most of them that, that aren't trying to hide what they really mean. No more two nations, you know, who knows what they say. No more are you, you know, separated from God or something. Then they go on down, verse 24, David, my servant, will be king over them. Um, who's David, my servant, being king over? Obviously, that's Jesus. But how is he king over them? Well, in heaven, he's reigning in your hearts, not reigning on earth. And they shall dwell in the land that I give unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. Oh, that's heaven. Uh, remember, Abraham was looking for a heavenly you know, abode, and, um, you know, the land that he gave to Jacob was really heaven, so, like, these people, even though they would have understood this clearly, two nations, land that was given to Jacob, uh, David, my servant's going to rule over them, like, the, to, no more two nations, where you have the northern, southern kingdom split, um, Israel that is gathered out from among the heathen because they've been scattered in God's wrath like they were in 70 AD. Even though all these things have very easy, applicable, understandable, historical, grammatically sound applications that make sense, no. Because of a few, uh, you know, ambiguous or, you know, twistable verses, we're just going to reinterpret this verse. Uh, in these verses, to make this uh, heavenly spiritual promises to the one people of God, not to ethnic Israel, not to ethnic Israel. Um, this is this is you know. So we're Jacob. I'm you know as a Gentile right now living in Big Stone here in Virginia. I'm a Gentile, uh, but I'm Jacob, and uh, you know it, it's just it demolishes the text basically. They won't interpret it in a natural way. They never will interpret scripture like this. Typically prophecy. But even some other passages in the New Testament, they won't interpret it straightforward the way that most people would accept it. Uh, they 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 reinterpret it and change it to fit their system of theology that will not allow for a future millennial reign of Christ ultimately. And really, for some of them, not all of them, will not allow for a future salvation of of ethnic Israel. So that's just an overview of it. Maybe it's hard to follow, but it gives you an idea on the on the front of it with really the biggest problem I have of it. Uh, have with it, and it's really this that it is a major uh, distinction is is that it interpret it reinterprets Old Testament. Uh, a classic dispensationalist might say the Old Testament says this, the New Testament says this. The Old Testament means what it said then, nothing else, nothing no nothing really added to that. And you're going to get varying degrees of that. Progressive dispensationalists would say something like that's what it meant to them in the past. The New Testament reveals this. The mystery revealed now is that even though Christ will reign physically on earth in the future over Israel and in Israel, uh, the mystery revealed is like the Gentiles are invited in on that promise. And it's revealed that the new covenant also is has gone out into the Gentiles in a way that wasn't you know, necessarily revealed in that specific passage here or there. That's that's the way someone who's progressive dispensational should realize. And they would also realize a, a, a immediate and future fulfillment, a partial fulfillment of something. Um, the already of a fulfillment and the not yet to come of a fulfillment. Whereas a classic dispensationalist usually is their head will explode if you try to, you know, do solid exegesis and then a covenant theologian will say no that that might have seemed like it was to ethnic israel but in reality that was always to us that's always meant that uh, that does not mean a future reign of christ on earth though though they would have took it that way no um israel's out uh, they they had you know a chance and god cut them off in 70 a.d and they're done the kingdom's delivered over to you know the Gentiles, and uh, now everybody can come in. Jew can be saved. Uh, they can be saved just like a Gentile can be saved, and that's true. Uh, but there is no future salvation for Israel. There is no uh, future uh, promises to be fulfilled in Israel. Uh, the church is the true Israel. And uh, some of them will say it, it is replacement theology, straight up. The church has replaced Israel. Some will say it's fulfillment theology. Uh, the church has always been the church. Israel is the church throughout history, and it's just can, kept going, type thing. Um, but that's that's generally it. I don't I don't want to make it too convoluted. It's basically a system of theology that spiritualizes away all the promises uh, of a future earthly reign of Christ, all the promises to ethnic Israel in general. Some millennial theologians believe in a future salvation of ethnic Israel, but that's that's the best I can do in 15 minutes. Um, 
and I look forward to doing New Covenant Theology, which should be more interesting. So hope this helps somebody. Uh, comment if you want. And uh, until next time, God bless.